Welcome to the Real Advisor Podcast, T-R-A-P, TRAP. Please follow us and join in the conversation on Twitter at Advisor Podcast, where you can suggest ideas and themes you'd like the TRAP team to discuss. Also remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a six out of five star review on iTunes. Doing all this really, really helps us, which means we can do more to help you. Now let's head over to the studio for the latest pile of trap. Yes, indeed, dear Trappists. Welcome back to what many people are calling episode 22 of the Real Advisor podcast, T-R-A-P Trap. My name is Nick Lincoln or Lick Ninken. Joining me once again, the band is reunited, babies. We're back on to the track pack is back. The three horsemen of the apocalypse, Alan the Storyteller Smith, Andy Hart, and Carl the Voice Widger. Carl, just before we go into Andy's high energy uh, reading of the reviews, you've had a bucket list moment. You, t- you, you chartered the 777 and took your brood uh, to the west coast of a former colony. How was your time out there, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> we did char- chartered the economy seats in Aer Lingus Whew, for a long haul flight. Uh, not too bad on the way over, but by Christ, that was a long journey on the way back. Can I just say before I start, well done to Amelia and to thank you and to the people who private messaged me to say that Amelia was much better. It's Amelia, Amelia on the show. Whilst that, she investigates, oh. interrogates, and soaks it up as she goes. Whilst it may well be true that Amelia was much better, it's just plain mean telling me that by message. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, we went, we went to um, San Francisco first. We did a couple of days there, did all the touristy things like cycling over the Golden Gate Bridge, which was great fun. However, in San Francisco, you can't but be struck by the amount of homeless people. And it seems to me America is very much broken. It's the haves and the have-nots. There ain't in any in between. And it's literally every 50 yards there's homeless people. So that kind of does detract from it a little bit. And it is mega expensive. So um, just be warned if you're going there. We then went from there on to Yosemite National Park, which has been on my bucket list forever. Um there, there is no picture that can do Yosemite National yeah. Park justice. It is the most incredible place I've been in my life. And people would often say, you know, that a view took their breath away and I'd always be going, oh, really? I don't know really what you're talking about. I do now. This place is incredible. Now, with four teenagers in tow, uh, doing six days hiking and cycling around uh, Yosemite National Park was probably one day too many. Uh, But in fairness, they rode in and they really got stuck into it. So it was great fun. We went from there then to Monterey, which is um, on the coast. Um, That was also magnificent. The, The weather, strangely, wasn't fantastic. We were getting kind of 17, 18 degrees. As Irish people used to rain and much lower temperatures, that was just about perfect for us. Yeah, nice. <laughs> um, but 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 genuinely, for all of the we kind of packed, I'd say four weeks into two weeks, so we were very 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 active. So those temperatures were absolutely perfect for us. Um, very 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 expensive over there, though, like absolutely mega expensive. Top tip, I would say, if like me, you have four teenagers. Uh, I, we did Airbnb in Yosemite and in Monterey. Definitely a brilliant idea because everyone kind of gets their own space and uh, it's just much better than jamming us into kind of two hotel rooms, which we did in San Francisco, where people are, are all on top of each other. The boys didn't mind it so much, but the three girls weren't major fans of it. Oh, and by the way, uh, on bucket list items... Um, so I ticked off a number of them in the, on the trip. One being to see The Cure play live. Absolutely magnificent. Uh, Yosemite was another one. And then I went whale watching in uh, Monterey. Absolutely terrible. <laughs> it was like four hours of drizzly, cold, miserable stuff to see one whale about 100 yards away for four and a half seconds uh, and cost a pretty penny, as you can imagine. So... Uh, I I couldn't help but think about, you know, bucket lists and having only one or two things in your bucket list is is probably a bad idea because they can underwhelm as much as they can overwhelm. So, like, 
definitely Yosemite j- j- was everything I thought and, and way more. But Jesus, whale watching. Now, I'm sure loads of people have had magnificent experiences whale watching, but just we didn't because you can't tell the whales that we're on the way, lads. Will you just pop up there? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, have an, I, I actually have a bucket list. I have a little diary and I write loads and loads of things in it. And I've, I think 40, not, not I think, I know. I have 48 items there and I've ticked off three now this summer. Um, so I think really important and, and as real financial planners to encourage our, all of our clients to, you know, really work on this. And, and I think if you write things down, it, you know, they just tend to happen. So, you know, for me, it was, it was absolutely brilliant. We had a magnificent time. And uh, yeah, back at it now. Was uh, was being a co-host on the Real Advisor podcast? Was that on your bucket list? Is that another tick off? No, Just as I told you, the only reason I did that was bucket list. <laughs> what, what? Oh yeah, was no that that both of those were were as a result of FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the only reason we keep on going, isn't it? It's, like it's the final thing. Just just a quick quick point on that. I did a, I mean, literally 25, 27 years ago, I did a similar trip with a group of friends, flew to San Francisco, drove down that Pacific Coast Highway. Um, Lovely. Lovely. I end up down in Los Angeles, then on to San Diego, crossed to Las Vegas, a few days in Vegas, and then flew down to New Orleans for the Mardi Gras. And all the, you know, decades and decades later, when I meet up with the pals of mine that I went with, we we'll still talk about that trip, some of the sort of crazy things that went on. So there's another example of spend your money on experiences more than things because you never go to fashion. They'll always keep giving. Yeah. You'll always have the memory, hopefully, if they are good memories. No, to- look, totally and 100%. And we, like, look, we made memories of a lifetime for sure. I would say, Alan, the trip I just embarked on and the trip that you just t- t- discussed there, the only thing similar were that they were both in America. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah we, did, we didn't we didn't do any whale watching yeah we, watched, we yeah. saw we watched right, a few right, other you, things all right yeah, you celtic on. brothers um let's 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 try and bring some orders to the show that's great Carl. great <clears> to have you back and we mean that uh yeah we kind of mean that andrew <laughs> review time go on energize us yeah okay so we're up to 114 reviews <laughs> i think on the Apple Podcast platform. So here we go. <laughs> Review number one. The four horsemen are crushing it. Five stars. Great insights. Useful uh, advice. Interspersed with lots of banter and invaluable resource. That's from Phil723. Next up, a good listen. Five stars. A must listen wherever you are in your financial planning career. Some great insights and nuggets and very easy listening. Nick Platt. Finally, fantastic. We did this five one last stars. week. I don't think we did. Well done, guys. This podcast is great. Maybe uh-huh. the Nick one. All right, let's move on. Back to you, Chairman. Just, just so the trap is slow, Andy. You, as much as I love you, you are a weirdo. Who, who, who puts things and then reads from the bottom up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Have you just learned that he's a weirdo? I'm going from the oldest no, to I'm, the newest. I'm knowledge. <laughs> oldest to the newest. Oh, anyway, okay. Right. So, uh, just, just uh, my. Uh, so, the, the lovely Penelope has had her hair styled this morning, um, and I think. She, so, if there is a crashing sound in the background, it's just her doing something with her stylist, whose name apparently is Victoria Rose. There you go, Victoria. A free shout out on the on the Trap Podcast. And I am recording this as the fourth day of the first Tense Ashes test commences, literally eleven o'clock this morning. So I won't know what's going on there when we end this. It could all be over. Right, Mister Hart. Next gen conference. Give us the lowdown, Daddy. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was there, correct timestamp, this time last week. Uh, it was in Manchester. I was there for a couple of days. Um, yeah, superb again. Uh, yeah, congratulations to the whole Next Gen team. We put on a great show. The amount of effort to put that on was a lot. There are loads of different streams, lots of the stuff going on. They had a sort of gathering party awards the night before we were up for an award, but sadly we didn't uh, win it. So Sam Oaks at the Financial Life Planner podcast won it. So congratulations to them. Um, yeah, it was great. Uh, We're not great bitter event. at all. We're not bitter at Bullshit. all. Maybe, uh, maybe next year we'll uh, come back fighting. Uh, and I spoke to a load of people no, who so. were there, um, and loads of them were huge <clears throat> fans of Trap. So I'm going to shout out a couple of people now. Uh, ben Baldwin, uh, George Agon, Harry Duncanson, Dan Weston. They're all sort of uh, avid listeners, so I thought I'd give them a, a personal shout-out. But, yeah, lots of people in the audience and delegates do uh, listen to the show, I'm sure. So, yeah, we're uh, doing some some good work. Back to you, boss. Very good, fellow. It's still with you the next one, matey, actually. Divorce and clients withdrawing money to help kids. 
Yeah, this is, I suppose, a slightly bigger topic, but I've got a couple of clients at the moment who are doing this uh, and helping out their children who are going through uh, tough times. Um, and one of them's sort of a relatively small amount, let's call it 10% of their overall investable assets, but one of them's a, a, a lot larger amount. Uh, and I know, obviously, real advisors listening to this will, will, will straddle this sort of situation with their real clients. Um, but to me, I always sort of boil it back down to, obviously, it's great that they're in a position that they can help their family. You know, you invest for your unknown future. The more wealth you can create, more, you know, wealth is freedom, freedom is opportunity. Um, so, yeah, it just reinforces you don't know what's around the corner. You know, we've got clients now that are, you know, having to, you know, pay financial contributions to things that are not even, you know, th- their issues. Um, you know, friends and family having sort of medical issues, friends and family having sort of marital issues. So, yeah, I just thought I'd bring it up on the podcast because I'm dealing with two at the moment, live cases. As I say, one's a relatively small amount and one's a, 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 an incredibly large amount of their investable assets that they're now having to uh, pay to help uh, a family member. And so I thought I'd um, um, raise it to see if uh, you guys obviously have come across this. And yeah, just to, just to bring it bring it up, really. I've got, can I have a quick, quick comment yeah, go for it. on that? This is yet another example of the fallacy of trying to be overly accurate with long-term financial planning. Exactly that. You know, people over, over-engineer the – in fact, I don't know if you're going to mention this, Nick. There's something else that you shared with us a couple of days ago about the kind of the, the overly precise nature of withdrawal amounts and various other things like that. And, and people get overexcited about, you know, um, expected rates of return for future assets and all that sort of stuff. I've always said these sort of things, and they tend to be like yeah, – Death, divorce, disability, things that happen, not expected. You've all, you know, health, healthcare issues. You know, you can all of a sudden, yeah. you know, the cost of paying for, a, I don't know, cancer treatment or something like that, if you're not fully covered for it, is crazy. <laughs> tax rates, for God's sake. You know, suddenly, you know, we've had, you know, tax rates are, are, are increasingly getting higher in the UK and they could get higher still. Interesting. All these various other things which aren't really built in to most financial planning no, they can't models. Be. How, the point how, being, how can you? How can you build them in? They can't be. You can't say you may, yeah. your, your daughter might get divorced yeah. sometime and might need help out with you know yeah. buying a new house or something like that <laughs> because there's, there's no limit to what the potentials are. Exactly. And yet there are, there are people commenting, so-called experts commenting about trying to be overly precise with the estimated rates of return. Yeah. Nick. Okay, well, Carl, Carl first, and I'll, then I'll pick up All on right. the point that you raised there, Anna. Yeah, I think um, Mitch Anthony coined the phrase, uh, when life goes in transition, money moves. And, you know, isn't that exactly what you're saying here, Andy? And um, th- that's the point. You, you, you never know what's, what's going to happen. The one thing I would, I would just um, caution against is, is we've had a number of clients in similar positions, Andy, right? And it's really important that that's the EGM, right? That's not your annual planning meeting that's the oh, yeah, EGM that's something's happened we need to speak yeah yeah co- but come in let's do the cash flow plan because we always make the point first and foremost the couple sitting in front of us are our clients now if there's obviously enough cash clearly to see them through well at that stage we can start looking at how to distribute wealth and all of that kind of stuff so i think it's really really important to do your cash flow plan and to say if you do this this is the impact it's going to have and look like you're saying it can't be precise but at the same time if it's going to move someone from a position of the cash flow plan says yeah you're all good to whoa you're going to have a, a problem when you're 82 well you know you, you you have to give bad news just like you you give good news and you have to yeah. be, tell the truth about the money nick yeah, yeah. Uh, Alan's point was uh, uh, this, this, and I, th- I think we all believe this, and I've certainly, I think m- most of what we do actually is art, uh, the art of managing people and not science. And uh, I read something, one of these American guys, these, these, you know, this from the kits, this kind of brigade, Wade Fow, P F A U, but it's pronounced Fow, yeah. I believe, who, who's done research showing that the average American who's investing in a 60 40 portfolio needs to save 16.6% of their income to achieve X amount of, of the equivalent of their salary in retirement. And I just thought, what a load of bollocks that is. What a load of – as, as, just, just, as soon as you go to a decimal point, I'm thinking bollocks. You know what I mean? It's Completely. just like you, you're, you're yeah. trying to make something precise. Yeah. It's totally imprecise. Andy, you had a the, digit raised. Yeah. Um, the final point on this is we, we seem to have a problem with creating wealth for wealth's sake. 
um, you know, we always want to put sort of a reason to investing and saving, whereas it's like we're investing and saving for our unknown future. We just don't know what it's going to look like. I mean, there's some few markers in the sand. We potentially want to stop work. Then we potentially want to give some, you know, gifts and weddings and stuff for the kids. But apart from that, again, it's the unknown future. So if the returns are available and they're there, you know, building portfolios of people in their 50s, 60s, that then they call upon in their 70s and 80s, the fact that there's a little bit more money in there, I've not got a problem with that. But all this, uh, your financial plan immediately says um, that you need to reduce your investment return, you still be okay. You don't know what the unknown, you know, the unknown future holds. So I've got, I haven't got a problem with creating wealth for the sake of creating wealth. I've got a problem with spending wealth for the sake of spending wealth. But creating it, I've got no problem with. You know, wealth is freedom. Freedom is opportunity. I think a lot of us sometimes, uh, some people miss this. So, yeah, who's next? Okay, dokie. And it's you again, my friend. Uh, you've just typed in bucket list on the uh, the agenda of dreams. Oh, that's just a very uh, throwaway point. But we were talking about bucket lists. So mine is uh, way less grand than Carl's. But a couple of weeks ago, uh, I went to an event in Abnesia in uh, Ibiza. The event was at Elro. And for me, it, it, it is a bucket list event. So I, I ticked that off, uh, albeit a, a small one. But you're right. You should have a load of bucket list events. I went to see um, you know, Barcelona versus Real Madrid last year. It was like the worst football game in my life. If that's If that's all I'd be looking forward to, then then wow, I'd be very disappointed. I, I don't know if this is as bad as whale watching. Whale watching sounds worse, but you know, hey ho, we'll, uh, we'll 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 fight over a over a pint. I think I think that's a, that's a good point actually. Bucket list. You need to have a lot of things on it because you will be disappointed. Because it just reminded me of going to the Grand Canyon, and that's supposed to be a bucket list thing. And that, that was one. I went, eh, all right. It's a big hole in the ground, but apart from that, I wasn't got, overly got, impressed. I've got one bucket list item now at my age: is to wake up to a dry mattress. Right, um, me Never next. Happened. Uh, me next. And for people that were people watching, consuming this, who aren't in this thing of ours, who are Joe Public, uh, this next thirty seconds just raising from your life. Uh, general investment accounts, GIAs. Uh, I, um, I I use accumulation units in client portfolios, but for GIAs, I've now had to create a whole batch of identical portfolios, for, but with income units. <laughs> Because income units throw off income that goes into the cash pot on the platform. And with the CGT allowances plummeting and plummeting and plummeting, I don't think going forward you can be selling down accumulation units because you're going to be crystallizing capital gains. So just a little in the weeds thing there that for your GIA portfolios, if you don't do it already, maybe create mirror ones for income units because you, you don't want to be using up that £3,000. You know, any decent portfolio, any decent growth, that 3 k allowance is gone and your clients are paying unnecessary tax. So that's just a little trick of the trade. Um, Mr. Smith, you had, well, you've had many incidents in your life, <laughs> ongoing legal battles. And again, we, we still support you. Um, Sorry, Nick, the M&S Nick, incident. Nick, Nick, just to push back on that mm. from a technical point of view, is that correct? Because it doesn't matter if it's accumulation or income, the net tax position is going to be the same, how they declare it. Are you just talking about it from a practical management point of view? I'm talking that when you have to replenish the cash bucket in a GIA portfolio each year, if you sell down accumulation units to do it, you are going to be crystallizing capital gains. Whereas if the income units, the dividends and fixed income coupon comes into the cash and does it automatically, you don't need to sell units to replenish the cash pot. Mm, okay. So from the tax point of view, mm. it's a net net, but cool. Kind of in, in the weeds. Okay, it's in the weeds, but it's, no, so it's, it's definitely, no, that's what I've just said is right. Right, M&S incident. <laughs> The, the famous M&S incident uh, of a couple of days ago. <laughs> so, nothing bad happened. I was, I happened to be no, just no, oh, a couple of days ago. Something funny did happen, this Alan. Is, say the funny story. It's, wait, it's really funny. Just say it. Just say it. Say the whole story about you. What went funny story? And, about your phone percentage and all that. It's really funny. Your phone was <laughs> well, at 1%. That's kind of it. Go on. No, say it. It's really funny. Oh, that, that's, that, that's not really that funny. No, it I, is it, funny. this is just a kind of... All right, I'll say part part of this story. This was just oh, a very simple gosh. experience that happened to me the other day, and and I, I'm just sort of send, say, sharing the message that is kind of as as Hart always says, the good we do. I popped into Marks and Spencers to buy lunch a couple of days ago. I'm just sort of mo- walking around there, and yes, as a side as a side story, my phone, my mobile phone, was with me had one percent battery left in it, and I needed that to buy my buy my lunch. You know, because I used the, you know, the, the, the contactless part of the, um, of the phone. I didn't have anything at means of payment. So I pick up my sandwich and my drink, blah, blah, blah. And then this random guy walks up to me. He goes, hi, oh, excuse me. Do you name Alan? Do you have a podcast? I went, yeah, yeah, I do. He said, yeah, I listened to the Trap podcast. I listened to your other one, Bulletproof Entrepreneur. I found you through Andy Hart's podcast, Maven Advisor podcast. I went, Maven Money. 
oh, that's nice. I thought that's quite you know, a nice bloke, kind of man bun on, look look pretty cool and trendy. I said, what's your name? He goes, oh, it's da- Danny. I said, well, thank you. That's really nice. Thank you so much for that, um, that feedback. It's great. He said, no, no, it's been brilliant. He said, I came back from traveling, 50 grand in debt. Grab yourself a drink, a very long drink. It's story time with Alan Smith. Uh, Nick, anyone watching this on YouTube, Nick, that looks like you're drinking straight vodka from the bottle. <laughs> that looks like a vodka. I am drinking straight vodka from the bottle. <laughs> Just to get through my story. So Danny <laughs> says to me, mate, I came back from traveling 50 grand in debt. I've now built an investment portfolio with 100. In fact, then he said, no, actually more like 150,000 pounds in investments and savings. Great companies of the world, doing great, really happy. With Thanks so much for all all the work that Andy's done and you guys are doing. I listen to all this stuff. It's so, so helpful to me. So I thought, Lovely. That's really, really good. Thanks so much. Really appreciate your feedback. I said, have a selfie. Let's do a selfie so I can share share the love. So we did a selfie. Took a photograph of me and him. And then I went over to buy my food, my sandwiches, by which time my 1% battery had died. <laughs> so, well, say, say so I had to leave. part I, of the story, Alan. You went into M&S with something, didn't you, from a previous event you were at? Oh, sorry, that's it. And also, yeah, I forgot about that. Come I'd gone on. into m and I had a, as you do, I had a bottle of champagne sorry, in my hand. Dear, 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 dear Trappist, we've now migrated into the M&S podcast. Uh, in about three hours, we'll go back to the trap. Episode 22. I know, I forgot about that. I told Andy this story the other day, this and I forgot funny. the best bit of it. Go yeah, on, the best bit. I'd, I'd, I had, I'd gone in because I'd met an advisor in the morning. I had a breakfast meeting with this other advisor, and I gave him uh, some time and sort of helped him out. And he gave me as a gift for my time. Nice bottle of Verve Clicquot champagne, which is a bit odd walking around the streets of London with a, at a you know, about sort of 11 Not o'clock, 12 o'clock lunchtime with a, <laughs> with a bottle of champagne in my hand. But I didn't, it didn't have a, it wasn't in a bag. It was just this loose bottle of champagne that I was walking around with. And so I walk into Marks and Spencer's, try to buy my sandwich, got accosted by Danny, did a selfie, by which time my phone had died. I couldn't, I got to the counter to buy this, phone bloody died, and then I've got my bottle of champagne. So the woman comes up and says, well, sorry, you can't buy the goods now. I went, oh, yeah, no, I'll just have to leave it. I'll, just, I'll, you know, I'll starve, I'll go hungry. And then in the meantime, I get to take my champagne. She goes, whoa, 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 where are you going with that? I said, no, I brought this in with me. <laughs> she goes, are you sure? I said, I promise you, just run it through your system. I, honestly, I didn't. Uh, this. And she said, I'm sure you haven't taken that from the counter. I said, no, you'd have that tag thing on it. So I had this big debate with the woman from Marks and Spencer's. It was, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of an incident. You know, Marks and Spencer's that, Marleybone reported it as an incident. That, that is an entire episode of Kirby and Enthusiasm there. That <laughs> yeah, it had was. it out with the beginning and, and out. Yeah, and out it was. Uh, that, that's the story. Anyway, shout out to Danny. I'm glad that we're helping you. And um, <sighs> good we do. Move on. Wow. Oh. Excellent. Well done, Andy, for making him t- Can I just <laughs> follow up that point briefly? Just because it's relevant to something else, a statistic that I read that yesterday. Which is, and kind of linking these two sort of abstract, abstract stories, someone like Danny listens to these podcasts and a lot of our mantra is about, you know, invest, invest your money, invest in the great companies of the world, then go and do something else more interesting. Don't over-engineer, don't overthink it, just save as much, you know, whether it's 16.666% of your income or whether it's just what you can afford to do. Put your money in sensible investments and let, them, let the markets do the hard work. Um, two statistics, the MSCI Global Growth Index is up 26% year to date, 26% year to date. Tough year last year, fine. This year, 26%. Other statistic, 75% of ISA money in the UK is held in cash ISAs, cash ISAs. So 75% of the UK population who have taken the time and effort to open tax-effective savings plans aren't benefiting from this investment. So linking those two together, the likes of, of, of Danny and many others like him are listening to people like us, are helping themselves, are investing wisely. But unfortunately, the vast majority of the public, it would seem, are ignoring this stuff and are excited because they're able to secure 5% cash deposit return for, for the short term, albeit tax-free with an ISA wrapper. So Two random statistics, but relevant. And I'm glad that we'll keep sharing the message and hopefully helping other people to create their own financial independence and security. But just to chip in there, my, my best review on the Maven Money podcast was a one-star review when someone said, he just says the same stuff all the time, buy global equities. 
Yeah. That was, that was the best review I've got. It's a one star review. Anyway, yeah, back yeah. to you, boss. That's, that's, that's point well made. Hockey dockey. Well, on the on the on the sort of flavour of cash and so forth. I, I what I think is is a rapidly burgeoning, not scat. I don't use the word scatter, but I can't. It's, it's a bit of a disgrace. The fact that for fifteen years we've had you know negative real interest rates and cash returns were you know in nominal terms disastrous, and we're after after allowing for inflation, we're, we're just a proper pile. Obviously, we've had base rate rises at a record rate in the UK, and then out wherever they are, four and a half percent. I'm not quite sure. Um, and suddenly, the, this this thing about platforms taking a skim off the top of what they earn on cash has become. I think it's become really, really relevant because the long term trend for interest rates in the UK is about where we are now. It's about four and a half percent historically. So, assume this goes on, it'll go on and go on, and it'll be a bigger scandal. And if rates go up more, it's going to be it's going to become a real thing. So, so, basically, a lot of platforms don't pass on what they get from cash. They 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 keep back a tiny slither of it for the for the customer, for the investor, and they they, they keep the rest. And there's an article in, in CityWire, uh, New Model Advisor, uh, whatever whatever it's whatever that is uh, called. No, it's still called New Model Advisor, isn't it? And um, how Transact share prices has, 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 has struggled recently. One of the primary reasons is that Transact don't take a cut. They don't skim off the top of the cash, but other platforms do, like AJ Bell and Hargreaves. And Har- I'm reading this out verbatim. For the six months to the end of last year, Hargreaves made $122 million from cash accounts, more than a third of its total revenues. And AJ Bell's ongoing profitability growth, revenue growth, is, is up massively. They don't disclose how much comes from cash, but it's just gone through the roof. And I think it's. I, I just think it's. Here we are. We spend hours, don't we, looking at you know platform due diligence and this. You know, this one's five basis points more than that one. How on earth can you justify it? And this whole cash skin thing blows that out of the um, the water. And here's the reason why. And this is from something that Transact released. Uh, I'll read it out verbatim. So, as interest rates rise, you will have seen many more reports on the different approaches platforms are taking with client cash. One platform recently reported profit of 24 million from their clients cash alone our approach is different we think that it is wrong to skim and that's transact adjective skim client interest this is an interest investment return just like a dividend or, or distribution so we pass on all interest to clients anyway long story short what transact get now on cash is just over four percent for clients and they pass that all on to the clients four percent now here's the interesting thing back to transact the average portfolio with transact is valued at two hundred and thirty five thousand pounds with six and a half percent typically in cash and what that means is on that six and a half percent in cash with the current rate of interest the client earns 26 basis points that more than covers transacts costs in other words at the moment transact pay you to put money on their platform and that's a bog standard four and a half percent long-term trend uk interest rate and i just to me that is that that is a, a credit to transact and some other platforms do pass on the full amount but not many um and i'm yeah, just thinking you know they just you're getting a free platform at the minute. The, the, and I know averages contain a whole range of, of, of SKUs and distributions, but the average part on Transact is getting a free platform and two basis points thrown in. Um, so I don't know if you guys have a view on any of that, Andy. Yeah, I'll, I'll go now. It's a, it's a huge subject, Nick. Um, it crops up every so often, and there's probably someone that's done a proper report on it in the UK. If we're going anywhere that the US is heading, all the big platforms in the US have technically brought their freeze down to zero because of this skim. Um, I think the clients will be net-net however way they slice and dice it because if they don't skim, they're just going to increase you know, the basis points they charge directly to the client. That's why sometimes from a like-for-like basis, the ones that do skim come up cheaper in the sort of leagues than someone like Transact does. So, yeah, I mean, it's smoke and mirrors, don't get me wrong. Uh, the regulator obviously is okay with it because Hargreaves are, are, are straddling the regulator line. They're not breaching any rules, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I think the typical platform has cash of 10%. Transact is lower because it's advised clients, so they're doing less mistakes. That's a, an interesting point in itself. Um, yeah, this is a huge, huge subject, but well done for bringing it up. Uh, who's next? Next on I, I, mean, the I, I would just, I would from- just say that it, it just, it's, to, to me, it just smacks of the, it's, it's kind of just about integrity. It's integrity is whose money is it? Really, is it, and I think it's double dipping because I don't see someone like Hargreaves Lansdowne, but you don't get a discount on their platform charge of forty-five basis points that Hargreaves charge. Plus, they're making the money, as you say, like a, th- a third of their revenue, third of their profit comes from this cash skim. It just, can, I mean, can, 
Can I interject? I mean, what, what these platforms will say, and it's true, but they will, they will say, well, we disclose this in our terms and conditions that we don't pass on the full amount, and, and which, you know, which legally they tick the box. I just think as advisors, we need to, you've had 15 years of not having to give a monkeys about this because they haven't been yeah. a race in retirement. But now, yeah. you, if you're not doing this as part of your platform due diligence, I'd want to know, okay, you, I'm picking AJ Bell here, and if I, I think their standard platform pricing is 20 basis points compared to Transact's 25. In actuality, on transacts, the actual client's paying zero. You're probably still paying 20 basis points in AJ Bell. Okay, yeah. just to, that's quite a cost difference, I would say. Okay. Um, yeah. Mr. Good Mr. The, the, the Voice, the Voice, Metis Island recruitment update. Yeah, so um, I said before I went away that we were um, launching a recruitment drive. So we had seven positions open, um, and I think we're. We're there with four of those positions, but one of the the ones that, um, thank you, one of the ones that we're struggling a little bit, being honest, right, is getting um, experienced private client managers on board. So that's basically people who are out there advising clients. Um, And look, I just want to shout out, because I know they're watching or listening to Trap to say, send me a DM if you're in a inverted commas financial advisory firm and you're just selling product you know there's a better way of doing it you know you owe the clients please send me a direct message Hilarious. and they'll also they'll also see that i was deeply uncomfortable with the content <laughs> of some of today's podcast yeah, yeah. owing to the irish uh, versus uk cultural differences There we go. The voice, the voice saving um, the Irish financial planning community by doing the right thing. And an advocate, if you want to join a proper firm, Metis Norway is the place for you. And let's leave it there. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Smith, the ideas exchange. Yeah, I'm just going to pull a couple of uh, thoughts together <coughs> on this. The ideas exchange, which we have mentioned a couple of times on this podcast before, is a kind of mastermind group of, I can't remember, about 36 now sort of business owners, financial planner, business owners, senior people ranging from, you know, sole one-man band operations to quite significant, you know, big, big companies or even, you know, global banks, I think, in one one or two cases. Um, and and it's exactly that. We generally meet once a month over breakfast in the West End of London. We just had our – we have twice a year we have a bit of a social. We have one at Christmas and we have one in the summer. We just had it the other day and it was a lot of fun. We all got together, stood in this blazing hot sunshine and drank copious amounts of champagne and absolute and had shambles. I had a good laugh. Uh, at the same time, a couple of days ago, I got a message from – and I'll shout out to Fabian Taylor. Let me just briefly read out – Fabian said to me, hi, Alan, I'm an IFA based in Nottingham and a big fan of Trap and Bulletproof Entrepreneur, the other podcast. I'm looking to get an ideas exchange or similar set up in Nottingham as a forum to share ideas between IFAs. I know you've touched upon it in Trap, but I was wondering if you'd be able to, willing to give a bit more detail about it, i.e. the format it takes, what the membership fee goes towards, the type of people you have speaking. I want it to be seen as valuable to potential members and not just another conference seminar where a fund manager or product provider is trying to flog their wares, blah, blah, blah. So I said to Faye, rather than just reply to his message, I thought we could just have a quick chat about this here because as I did reply to Fabian, I think that every sort of community up and down the country in every you know, major or city or town could have their own and should have their own networking group, even if it was half a dozen of you. You don't need to have 36 or 40 people, but a, br- a group of people. So as I say, I know we touched on this before, but I think it'd be worthwhile just maybe Nick as the newest member to that, that group, sharing your thoughts on the benefits of a mastermind group, what the format ought to be, who should be invited, what about speakers, and uh, you know, what, what, what do the fees go to, go to pay for? What are your sort of headline thoughts on this that that will be helpful for Fabian and for other listeners? Thank you for the complete lack of preparation or, or, no or leading. So, are you asking me what I think of the ideas exchange? <laughs> yeah, or, or just the the idea of a group of advisors who meet periodically, share their best ideas, thoughts, oh, best yeah, practices. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's, God, it's just cliche. It's like, what's the downside? I, I think absolutely, especially if you're a small, you know, one man band or a solopreneur, whatever you want to call it, the the traditional family kind of IFA size, maybe one, two advisors and, and 38 power planners doing God knows what. Um, 
Yeah, I think, and you, you're in your own little cell. And it's, I, 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 yeah, I'm a recent. Well, I've been with the Ideas Exchange. What probably three? Years, I joined during the the Fauci flu bedwetting. So I think three years. Um, and I do get I do get stuff from it. a lot of it flies over my head because, the, as you said, the firms are so disparate in size. So when they start talking about I don't know diversity and inclusion or, or, or client experiences or getting clients on the on the board and all this kind of stuff, you know, I kind of glaze over. But I, I get enough from it to um, to make it worthwhile. And it's easy to do, isn't it? It's way easier than it was 15, 20 years ago. You got the internet now. You just put the clarion call out on the internet and say we're looking to we're going to meet at the Nottingham. I don't know, whatever, the Nottingham Ibis every every Wednesday, you know, um, every third Wednesday of the month, if, come, come along. And, you, yeah, but what you give him, I've, I've got no interest in what people give their money to. Uh, that's that's not my purview at all. But I think it's, defi- it's definitely worth doing. And then uh, I belong to a couple of groups. Some are very loose and informal. They just, just, just tend to meet over lunch and, and to more structured, whereas the ideas exchange, because it's been going for like four decades, hasn't it? So it's got a oh. whole, there's a whole structure to it and an organisation and with 38 <laughs> active members and an alumni as well if, if that's not included in the 38 it's quite a serious well there's I'm, I, there's that I, I can stay categorical there, there is no i doubt there's any longer standing ifa peer group network group in the in in the uk than the ideas of change but yeah go crack on and do it absolutely and by the way while we're talking about nottingham our thoughts go out to the uh the parents of those of those afflicted by the latest uh horror um yep. yeah that's my view yep. andy views over to me. Uh, yeah, it's another huge subject. It's definitely a meat and potato subject. I think we covered it before, but yeah, masterminds are, you know, is it um, how to get rich or whatever, Dale Carnegie? It's masterminds are the, the way to, you know, business riches. Um, I've been part of the Ideas Exchange for 11 years. It is a good club. It's very well structured. That's why it's been successful. Uh, you know, that we're strict on attendance. We're strict on timings. You know, I, I like a club that's well run. Um, the fees have gone up over the years. Um, when I first joined, I've been there, as I say, 11 years. I can't remember. It was like 700 quid. Uh, then it went up to a grand. Then it went to 1,200. Now it's at 1,500. But we've increased the fees because we are allowing nobody um, to pay to play, you know, pay to speak. When I first joined, my God, the standard of mm. speakers were – I'm amazed I hung around. Thank God Alan was there to say, no, Andy, it's not that bad. Forget that last 45 minutes. You know, they're just there to – pay for the scrambled eggs. I thought, okay, at least there's some, some method to this madness. Um, yeah, I recommend setting them up. Uh, I've sort of got a Voyantist sort of mastermind. This is a, an example of a mini mastermind. A Next Gen is another mastermind sort of organization. Um, so yeah, the Ideas Exchange, I think is probably the longest running, the, the most well run. Uh, and it's got such a mix of, of people in the room. And we do have a sort of structure that we can you know, loosely share if you were thinking about doing it. My advice to you would be, uh, yes, sort of start small, do it once a quarter, but get all the dates in the diary, get a small bunch of people already together. Yeah, ideally do it in a main city, do it face to face. We do uh, 11 a year, we miss out August and we do two Zoom meetings. But I probably think the Zoom meetings will go probably in 2024. Uh, and maybe the July meeting might go. So that we're going to have Miss July, Miss August, and we're going to have uh, 10 meetings a year. We meet at about, I mean, a bit more meat to the bones here. We meet at like eight in the morning, or sorry, half seven in the morning. We start at, let's say, eight. We have round robin topics. Then nine o'clock, we have sort of a, a presentation from one of the members, then a presentation from external. Then we have further round robin talks, and then we finish about half 11. Um, yeah, it's very uh, well run, well oiled. Uh, but like all clubs, it's got its challenges. Um, but yeah, I've sort of spoken uh, enough. Uh, over to you, Carl. Uh, yeah, we have we have hit on this before because um, when we did, I got a few uh, calls from people who are doing real financial planning in Ireland. Say, yeah, let's do it. So had a couple of cups of coffee, more than a couple actually, um, and it was up to me then to set it up. And I have done nothing about it. So I'm sorry, but it is on my agenda. <laughs> you have had um, a busy time. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I look. I, I'm all for it. I think it's a. I think it's um, a really great idea. The, 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 one of the things that I, I discovered recently was, as far as I know, there is Voyant is the main cash flow modeling um, software used in Ireland by anyone doing real financial planning. I think there is one other kind of entering the market and maybe making a bit of inroads. But in the east, right, which is where Dublin is, right. Um, there's only, I think, 14 firms in total. And Andy, you've probably trained at least half of them. But only 14 firms in total. Now, like, say the really big ones will 
count for one firm. So so they might have loads of licenses, right? But the people, there's a lot of people saying they're doing real financial planning, but actually the market is still really, really, really small. Uh, but I have met, I have been, the, the, one of the massive benefits of, of, of the Real Advisor podcast is that people who have listened to it have reached out to me and said, look, let's meet up. And they are all really good people. And they all have really, a little bit like our, our group here, guys, you know, you can't but benefit from sitting down and talking to people who are doing it as well because they'll have different slants on it or different ideas and, you know, you can only benefit from that. And, uh, you know, my final point in this is if the real financial planning market gets bigger in Ireland, well, Metas is going to benefit from that, but all the other firms will as well. And, and there'll obviously yeah. be a few will join us, and that's all, but that can only be good. Those, yeah. th- those, yeah. those stats Just sound a quick, very, quick, very quick low, quick Carl. Andy. Well, but those stats sound very low, Carl, but uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it. But maybe we'll have a quick word with our, our good mutual friend, Stephen Brown, to, to see, see where we are with all that. Over to you, That's Alan. where they came from. Okay, cool. Yeah, just to kind of uh, wrap this up, a couple of quick points. <clears throat> it's First of all, we, ha- we employ what they call Chatham House rules. So you're going to say things behind closed doors. You have to be comfortable with the people you share with because you might want to share some you know, relatively confidential information about your business or some challenges or some issues. So you've got to be able to largely trust the people. You set down your rules at the beginning. There's, I think as we have talked about before, there, there's, there's rules for bringing people on. And if, if I think if more than one or two people object to any potential new member because they've got past issues or challenges with them, not looking at you specifically, Nick, but um, <laughs> then members have got a chance to so-called blackball and, and not allow them in. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, because because Fabian specifically asked this about getting guest speakers and all that, and, and as, as Andy said, the, by far the best meetings, well, we, we have had loads of guest speakers in the past, and we continue to have guest speakers, but because we no longer pay them, um, we all, we're very, very selective about who will come along because by far the best sessions are the member sessions. We were all just you know, yeah. discussing issues, and you know, there's a lot of people there. But when I've, you know, I've come away from this meeting sometimes thinking, wow, really, you know, my, my, my notebook is fill, filled with you know, ideas or you know things to do or things to avoid doing. Little, so some of the experiences you hear other advisors, you think, God, that's you know, yeah, that's a real, are they in? that's a real challenge they've gone through. Ah, huh? sorry. Oh, sorry. Also, what planet are they on? Some of the stuff they bring up. Well, there's, a, yeah, really? there's, there's yeah. something you just scratch, scratch your head and say, we've never never even thought about that. But, um, you know, as, as, um, as Nick has said, just I, I think most communities, most areas, you kind of know your local firms. You know, if you are in Nottingham, you probably know three or four others in the general area. So reach out to them, book it in the diary, and just do it. Breakfast is a good time. And, and if you do it, start early enough. It doesn't eat up too much of your day. And, um, and, the, and the, so, therefore, the membership fee should really just cover expenses. Yeah, you know, we've we've okay. got other things. We've got charitable things as well, but just cover we're, expenses, we're, cover the cost of your breakfast or your coffees or whatever, and yeah, just this is kind start. of this is kind of getting into 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 nuts and bolts of something that. But that's what you asked for. You wanted nuts and bolts. Just well, you know, fo- just be honest. I mean, you, 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 wipe, you wipe your ass with your hand. It's back and forth. I mean, let's not get too much in the detail. You can work it out, Andy. Just the final thing on that. Let's not skip past that. That's the first thing that Nick's ever won in his life. He got the most amount of black balls of any new member. So well done, Nick. Correct. Yeah, it's applause. about seven times now on this on this on this. <laughs> on this. <laughs> got that. We'll, we'll do okay. it. We'll do it a few more as well. Fine. And just but Andy, by the way, fella, um, if, if you're going to cough twice loudly, it doesn't matter if you lean to your left because your microphone goes with you, given it's dangling around your neck. So that, they were two beauties you dropped in there, right? Um, <laughs> Harvard, you know Harvard what? University did the study mic, in nineteen. 19- yeah. Done? Good. <laughs> Harvard University did a study in 1938, and it's still ongoing, looking into um, te- there were te- teenage, uh, mainly American men in 1938, and every two years interviewed them on their, on their progress through life. And most of that cohort, as you might imagine, are dead now, but there are some, some still alive. Um, an interesting report I, I read, and I don't think this is new news, but, but it's important to what we do, and I put a link to it in the so-called show notes, saying that these, 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 these people now who are in their 90s saying that retirement um, was something completely different from what they thought it would be in terms of challenges. For these, for these people, it wasn't the, uh, what we kind of – because we, we're consumed with the money side of it, making sure people have got enough, right, and managing future cash flows to match future events. Actually, what the number one challenge these people found who, who were once our age and younger and now are older and a lot of them are dead is that in retirement, it's having a purpose. And, and people retire from work and actually they, they might not miss the work that much, but they miss 
the interaction with colleagues. And that's just something that, you know, and again, Mitch Anthony, I think you mentioned his name earlier, Carl. You, you did mention his name. And you know, he says, it's not what are you retiring from, it's what are you retiring to. Okay. Uh, and I think this is the, the, one of the big things that we're going to find with our clients is, is just help. Maybe, I don't know if we should be involved too much. I'm not one of these sort of a, you know, happy, clappy, hold their hands kind of thing. But it's, it's just raising it with clients. Okay, we've made this decision that you, or you've made the decision you want to be financially independent at 55 and I'm helping you get there. Just, you know, what are you going to do? What you suddenly got 40, 50 extra hours a week. How are you going to fill it? So that's an interesting, interesting uh, thing I thought. And there's a Just a quick comment yeah. on that, Nick, if I may. Uh, there was a, I'm trying to remember the name of the program, but there was a program done on, on Irish television here. Um, can't remember the name, but anyway, they, they focused on people who have kind of successfully done the whole retirement thing, right? And really, you know, their longevity, their their mental capacity, you know, how did they, how, how did they do it? And the common thread amongst them all was that number one, they stayed really active, but number two, right? So everyone knows that the active people who dropped dead and all that kind of stuff, right? Number two, they had social elements to their life. So they were um, dancers, golfers, gardeners, you know, but they met other people. They had other things to get up every morning and go and do. And uh, yeah, you might, you mightn't be involved with talking to clients about that, Nick, but we very definitely do. And that's one of the reasons we, we decided we'd do Future You, uh, which I will talk about um, on the next episode um, as it's going to happen in September again. I think it's absolutely vitally important. And if you're doing real financial planning for me, you've got to bring these hard or maybe sometimes hard topics up. Just just closing on this, my, my favorite, I mean, I love all my clients, but my favorite client is a guy who is born 1933, so he's turning 90 this year. He's got the mental outlook of, a, of someone 40 years younger than him, and he's got more than enough. We do his cash flow, and his son sits in on the annual planning meetings, which is absolutely fine and something I would advocate. He's just closing another business deal. It's going to bring in a couple of hundred thousand pounds. He's 90 years old, but I just, I don't think part of his vim and vigor comes from the fact that he's still involved in a commercial thing, even though it doesn't need to be, because he loves it and he's done it all his working life. And he's got a whole network of people who he who he knows all their stories built up over, well, crikey, maybe 50, 60 years now. Um, so, you know, he's an example of living that, living that and how what difference it makes. And he's one of those people, you know, it's hard, how long will this guy live? So you, I, 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 it could be a long, long time. He's just so full of vim and vigor. We've given a few mm. shout outs to Mitch Anthony in this one, but what he says as well, another great, he's brilliant at wordsmithing some of these, these things, yeah. these experiences. He says, you need enough money to sleep well at night and enough purpose to get out of bed in the morning. Morning, yeah. I think that, that, yeah. that sums it's it up really, really nicely. That, that is a zinger. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, you've got um, an, <laughs> the shy, shiny magpie man. You've got an AI event for IFA workshop that you'd like to talk to us about. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned this last time, last time around. Um, there is a there's a specific event on July the fifth in central London, uh, all about AI, artificial intelligence, but more specifically for financial planners. So we're going to have a bit of a deep dive as it relates to the work that most of us are involved with. It's actually sold out, but there are we've, we've, we'll probably be able to squeeze another few tickets by the time this comes out. There's probably a chance there's probably going to be five or six tickets available. They'll probably go quite quickly. But if you listen to this and you're interested, um, do use discount code ALAN, A-L-A-N, get 50 quid off. It's only 150 quid, and it's going to be such full of such great content. So if you can, get along. Also, if you can't get along to it, there is a video version of it, and you get a stream, you get a chance to get the recording, which you can watch at your leisure later. There'll be some real practical tips. So do try to get along to that. And the other event, whilst I'm here to mention, again, mentioned it recently, uh, Bulletproof Entrepreneur podcast or a live interview with Henry Dimbleby, founder of the Leon fast food chain, sold for over £100 million. If you like meeting and speaking to sharp entrepreneurs who've had a great, great success and asking them questions directly, also pick up a copy of his book, signed autograph, then come along to Homegrown Private Members Club on June 26th. Uh, there's, a, there's a link in the show notes. And if you are a listener of this podcast, you will get complimentary entry free entry saving yourself 35 quid so if you're in in town if you're in the area do come along love to see you thank you okay great stuff thank you alan uh, we did have one more thing on the, on the topical tip here and mr hart's put in should we do that next show so i don't know if we should do that or not this is my 
My, big show, my, big show my migrating it's, clients it's, on an advice basis into one fund. It's a big subject, big um, subject, big we, subject. You think so? Enormous, enormous. Everyone, a lot of people are talking about it at Next Gen Conference as well. So let's let's do that a good crack. I think. Okay, all right. So we'll we'll, we'll carry that forward. Okay, thank you, thank you for the insight there, Andy. Um, okay, well in that case, then let's move on to what uh, to what some people may be calling the meat and potatoes of the show. Um, and in the last two episodes, we talked about the prospecting funnel, how you go through that, and then once you've got prospects into clients, because remember. You're betting them. They're not betting you. They might think they are. That's wrong. Once you've got them on board, of course, you do the initial planning meeting, which is the da da moment, and hopefully they buy into it. So now you've got these people on board, and you want to keep them on the arc with you because you've kept the loons away. You've got decent people who share values that are similar to yours. How do you keep them on the straight and narrow, and what is your ongoing communication strategy? So, Mr. Hart. Yeah, so our financial planning overlord uh, and trainer, Nick Murray, who uh, we roll our mats out in the morning facing Brooklyn, talks about this as uh, continuing to, you know, top up your client's vitamin C. Uh, The human body cannot retain vitamin C. You can sit down with the client and explain global equities, portfolios, asset allocation, you know, for two, three hours. The moment they leave the office, leave the Zoom call, uh, you know, a month later, three months later, they're going to throw a grenade into your business about something that's happened that's outside of your control. So it's just the wider concept. We've spoken about the initial stages with clients, the welcome meeting. Now it's a case of what do you do now? Well, I immediately, nuts and bolts, I uh, put them onto my, you know, convert kit email subscription service. So they're going to get monthly emails, newsletters from me that have got various things in them. It's just a, you know, a monthly touch point. Uh, social media you don't know who's following you on social media you don't know what clients are following you on social media you should just assume that all of them are uh, and your persona should be as you wish it to be um, so I'm quite public on uh, LinkedIn uh, quite public on Twitter not very public on Instagram I run Maven Money Podcast that's probably my biggest marketing channel uh, and again that's quite good because I can dive uh, or direct existing clients, new clients, potential clients to various shows that I think will be um, useful and impactful for them. It's all that sort of general social proof, isn't it, with ongoing marketing. Um, I share collateral every so often. I send sort of bulletins if something really important is happening happening in the world, but I generally don't do that that often. It's the whole don't panic. Well, I wasn't panicking, and so you told me not to panic type email. Um, I did quite a lot in COVID. Um, So that's it, really, the whole social proof conversation. Uh, and this is an example of it. So, yeah, some of our clients listen to this. Uh, I also sort of uh, focus on financial advisors as clients through the other businesses that I run. So, again, I, I do various marketing uh, in, in that space. So, yeah, I'm just opening it up. The next stage, once they're on board, they're welcomed. How then do we continue to top up their vitamin C, have touch points? What channels do we use? What channels do we not use? Um, I'll start with you, uh, Nicholas, or Lick. Sorry, over to you. Thank you, thank you. I'll truck up there, and thank you for that. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I think less is more with with client communications. You don't, you don't want to deluge them with with with, with stuff because it's like, oh God, there's something else to have for me to think about, maybe to worry about. But I do have, believe it or not, and you, the three of you, might chunter with this. I do have kind of an overarching strategy with clients, so I do this quarterly newsletter i'm not sure who reads i write it more for my own benefit and it's quite long and wordy but that just gets my name in their inbox i do i do the i do it's a naff thing maybe i don't do christmas cards i don't do anything but i do physical handwritten birthday cards for my clients okay and you know just from me blah 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 by the way since the since the year of your birth uk inflation has been x amount the great companies of the uk have returned y amount capturing that difference is financial salvation i've got a little card i put in there and 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 this is the thing i want to get get add my segment here it's consistency of language. It's consistency of message. That whenever you do touch your clients with communications, and and the point you made, Andy, about your your review, your your best review was your worst review because all he does is bang on about the same old bloody stuff. Yeah, in all your client communications, make sure you bang on about the same bloody stuff in the same language you used in the prospecting meeting, the same language you used in the initial planning meeting. Just consistency, consistency. So try and avoid using the word stock market. Try and avoid words like loss. Risk. Try and avoid technical words, even like personal pension. It's a free money growth pot. You know, the, the ISA is a tax-free growth pot. You know, and the GIA is just a growth pot, 
right? Don't use, we don't have to use these technical. We we we're, we're blessed. We've got the English language, right? It's the most beautiful language in the world, the most fluid. We can use whatever words we want to convey our message that we're comfortable. We don't have to use the technical jargon that's on the statute, but we might have to refer to that in the, in the suitability lessons. So forth, that's fine. But when we're communicating with clients, remember they don't know what they really don't have a clue what we're talking about most of the time. And and using arcane acronyms and other stuff in front of them, I think is a crime. So just use whatever language you you feel most comfortable conveys your message and then just make sure you you're consistent with it all the time. again it's the vitamin c the vitamin d what have you Re- repetition is the mother of all learning so i have a light touch contact point with my clients i know you read this again mainly american studies say you should be touching clients with communications eight eight eight, eight nine times a year i, I god knows where they get these figures from I, I i don't really do that outside of the annual planning meeting and of course around that there's a lot of communications because you're back and forth with data and updating and so forth um, but whatever you're doing consistency of language consistency 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 um mr smith uh, just a couple of points to add interested there was a i think i put a link to this in the show notes there was a an article online i read the other day advisor voice um and it was referring to a, a study spectrum group don't know who they are but another company who will do sort of financial advisor and financial advisor client studies and they cited the top four reasons for a client leaving an advisor. And three of the four most highly cited reasons were communication related. Things like, I never hear from them. I met someone the other day, prospective new client, became a, became a client, is currently with another firm elsewhere and said, I never hear from them. Never hear from them. Not a dicky bird. Markets up, markets down, anything going on, no communication whatsoever. And he said, and I've, he said I, I don't even meet them with them. I said, you're supposed to meet with them at least once a year. He goes, well, maybe I've been a bit busy. So you can go, sometimes people go for several years without any communication from clients, which is nuts, uh, I think. I think you're right. I think Dimensional have cited this in the past. If you've got one annual planning meeting, so you've got you, the client gets the injection of the serum, of the truth serum about the, you know, the, the, the real benefits of financial planning and sensible investment, gets that once a year. It's got 364 days of getting media noise, which is the antithesis, whether we say. So they pick it up. Um, interesting, Andy, you just in terms of a technical Aspect convert kit. We've just moved to convert kit from Mailer Light. Find it better, more comprehensive, better for tracking our data and everything. So we send a monthly client newsletter to existing clients. Generally got three articles in it on a monthly basis. Increasingly, my colleagues are writing articles as well, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, we are using a little we sometimes spice it up a little bit with chat gpt write an article and put it into chat gpt and just say to make this more you know more interesting more specific use more appealing use you know things like the the subject line is often you know that's where if you don't people people don't don't read it don't open it then you've wasted your time so you're spending a lot of time working out what the subject line is going to attract attention i think is important um and the other thing i'll just as a last point i'll say is this social media like like andy I've been active on social media now, more proactive for eight, probably 18 months now. Um, in terms of new business, it is now has fast become our single biggest source of new business inquiries and new new clients. Uh, and it is it's a bit of an ecosystem. It is LinkedIn, Twitter, and podcasting. And people sort of find you in one place, and then they go and track you down somewhere else. And before they know it, they kind of got a good sense of what you stand for, what your values are. And I guess a lot of people say, well, I'm, I'm not remotely interested in hiring them wonderful and those that are but the other thing is quite interesting is that our quite a few of our ex, our existing clients do like follow me in linkedin for example and sometimes the messaging that you put out you've got to be a little bit i say careful but just be, be alive to what some of the messages are because for example i'm like the rest of us i'm banging on all the time about investing in global equities investing in the great companies of the world but of course not all of our clients are 100 percent invested in equities so now and again you'll get somebody who reads something and goes hang on a minute why am i in a 60 40 yeah, you yeah. said the equity is the only place to be so they go back and have a chat with um, one of my colleagues as an advisor this happened recently client said i've just read alan's thing he said is way, investing in yeah. bonds is so, a total waste of time. So, Why so. am I forty percent bonds? And um, so you know we've got to just sort of unpack that with the client and say, well, because you're this is that was Alan's view was kind of generic, doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. We've got very very detailed specific advisory process for you, and for these reasons, it makes sense in a one to one basis. But fundamentally, we do believe that the engine of future growth and financial security independence is great companies of the world. But we do do bespoke one to one advice, but. Uh, 
Uh, and everyone is everyone is online nowadays. Everyone reads stuff. Everyone reads social media. A lot of people are on LinkedIn. A lot of clients are on LinkedIn, and the, and also the email inbox is kind of sacred real estate. Almost all your clients have got a whether it's a Gmail account or a business account. They check their emails, if not every day, every couple of days. And so, what you send to them, you've got it's a privileged position to be allowed to send people information into the inbox. Yeah, no one yeah. wants junk, so be yeah. very very careful about what you send out. It's got it's just got to add value. It's got to be something different and impactful. So it takes us quite a long time to craft these messages. But it's just popping up every month and just saying, Hi, we're here. And if you want to um, you know, it's just a reminder of people that we exist and, and the message remains consistent. What about you, Mr. Widger? What are your thoughts on ongoing comms? You do a lot of work, and, don't you? And sorry, Carl, I think you meant to you meant to go before then. I I, I went to Alan, so my apologies. Uh, no worries at all. No worries at all. Yeah, look, I, I'm not sure I have a ton more to offer than what's already been said. Um we do um a newsletter once every couple of months. Um just if I can help people on that, what we found was our open rate um almost doubled when we started putting in a piece about the team. And so focusing on a couple of team members or some of the softer stuff that some some, some of the people might be doing. We've uh, we've babies due in the O'Halloran, Andrews and Ross household over the next uh, couple of months. So there'll be there'll definitely be baby photos, um, God willing, uh, in the in over the summer months, which is great because it gives people an insight that we're real people and you know we're we have all the same issues that all of our clients do. So that's uh that that's actually apparently our open rate is double what the normal newsletter open rate would be which is really good but a little bit like what alan said we spend a lot of time figuring out which articles go in um we have though done and i think i've mentioned this before we also do an investment newsletter twice a year we've only just started that so we've just done the second one uh, it was all about the security of our client assets. So telling people, I suppose, the journey their actual money goes on and the securities, the security of those assets. And that's gone down really, really well. And that was as a result of direct feedback from our client survey. So that's really, really good. Um, blogs, it used to be just me writing um, all the time. And social media, it used to be just me all the time. And now I'm gone really bad at it because i don't have time or at least that's my excuse which probably is an excuse but the team have unbelievably upped their game so if anyone goes into the latest news section in in metas ireland um one could argue actually that we have too many blogs but that's never going to be a complaint that i'm going to be giving and they're all very active on social media so i think our we're casting that net with relevant information as wide as we possibly can um yeah, I don't. Other than that, there's a, there's a few other points I had there, but everybody else has kind of touched on them in, in to to a certain degree. So um, that's as much as I have to offer that would be valuable, I think. And are you comfortable with giving that good thrashing? Yeah, I think so. Uh, just a final point. I mean, all of this stuff sort of compounds, and most of it's sort of out there, you know, generally forever. Certainly, things like podcasts. So we're at sort of the somewhat infancy uh, of this sort of a period where, where we are in terms of information being out there. Obviously, we've got this AI journey to go on that nobody knows what it looks like. So things will be getting more and more sliced and diced. I did come across a couple of good AI tools uh, whilst in Manchester. I'm still in uh, Smithy's limelight here. Um, one that was quite good is there's there's AI avatars now that could basically look exactly like Nick Lincoln. I mean, like it. Perth does really? thought. Christ. Um, so, and what you can do is you can write a script for Nick Lincoln to deliver it uh, perfectly, word for word. But what will happen is people will be, able, will be able to offer this to professional services firms. So when you take on a new client, you'll send them a link with a video that's an avatar that's a perfectly scripted avatar of what you want to say to them, you know, just like you could do on, on Loom. But what I'm saying is it's going to allow a lot more funnels to be created. So you take on a new client and it's like some boring thing around pension drawdown. You've already got the script sketched out and the avatar of Nick Lincoln can deliver to you what may be a boring video about drawdown. But if they're interested in it, they'll just carry on watching it. So there's going to be a lot. The problem with financial advisors, most financial advisors, they've got all this intellectual capital in a box. You know, they're a good advisor. They've been doing it for 30 years. They're great in front of clients, but they're in this box. They don't get it out there. And we're all cottage industries. So every different advisor that's got no external message has just got all of this great intellectual capital inside a box. So I think this stuff's going to open up that 
So I'm somewhat excited about that. I mean, a lot of advisors have got capacity to take on new clients. They're really good at what they do. They're very you know, knowledgeable about what they do, but they're just not very good at getting their message out there to more and more clients. Uh, and I think things like AI will batter the barriers down and people will realize that it's not about going to you know, a shiny skyscraper in the city to have your money managed. Because you ask ChatGBT, what's the best investment fund? And it comes out with something that's plain vanilla. So a lot of the BS is going to be hopefully dispelled about the sort of next stage of AI that, that we're going into. But without me getting uh, too much on my soapbox, um, yeah, I think that sort of uh, avatar creation of, of, of uh, you know, custom avatar where you can get your message out to more and more people, more and more funnels. You can almost pretty much create the I think, I think, the I think this, is, this is the point. Yeah, the, the, point, the point being that all of a sudden, one thing is for certain, and as, as Carl has alluded to as well, creating content, be it newsletters, blog posts, podcasts, everything, is time-consuming. Just there's no, there's no doubt about it. And so therefore, we're kind of doing one to many. So we do when we do our newsletter, and it is a source of kind of – irritation for me somewhat is that we send we've got you know, clients like that like you've all got that everyone's got in, in, let's say in age ranges excluding say the children of clients but certainly your clients in their 30s and sort of normal engaged clients up until their whatever 80s 90s i don't know and we are sending out same newsletter uh, you know full disclosure to that and i that's kind of gets me a bit i'd what i'd love to do is just really say talk about avatars but really segment our own existing clients down it could be by age it could be by any number of different interest. ways of segmenting it because yeah. what we want to what we want yeah in, yeah it, interests or specific recent experiences or anything like that, that because the core message is probably 80 percent the same so you could say the same but whether it's about pensions or whatever yeah, least, but yeah, if you were yeah. saying specifically you know, if you are or aged over 75, this is something to pay attention to. So if I'm, for my 75-year-old client, 76-year-old client, you're going to say, oh, this is interesting. This really appeal- appeals to me. And my 38-year-old client is never going to see it in the first place, where at the moment they might see something like that and say, well, it doesn't apply to me. So AI will allow us to just create content at scale, but in a much more highly personalized way. And that also applies to sort of lead generation content. If you're creating something designed for optometrists in nottingham for example <laughs> then you can you can do it and it's it's 80 90 the same thing but if you're an optometrist in nottingham you're probably going to pay attention to that more than some generic post on linkedin about five key you know things to do about retirement so it's uh, an interesting time okie dokie chaps we're at uh, one hour and seven minutes in um, and I, I can see on my nest camera that She's lugged it up the drive. Our bulging sack of Trappist questions. And we didn't do any questions in the last episode with, with Amelia because we just basically ran out of time. As a reminder, if you want to post a question to us, do click on the pinned tweet at the top of at Pfizer podcast and or in the link in the so-called show notes. We will get around to your questions. We're doing them chronologically. It's a word I always struggle with. And even if you've asked a question that's been asked before, we will read your question now out of respect to you and as a thank you for contributing to the show, because it's your show as much as it's ours. Right, having got all that clap trap out of the way, first question is from Adam Lidlow. Bit of a boring one, guys, but some, including me, may find it useful. What strategy do you use for clients taking income from their portfolios to guard against sequencing risk, i.e. natural income, pot investing, cash buffer, unit encashment, or something in between. Really enjoy the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Adam. I don't know. I'm going to go. Actually, I'm going to pick on Carl. Cheers, buddy. <laughs> uh, none of the above, Adam. Uh, if you do real financial planning, you're going to know every single year at the annual planning meeting uh, what cash is required. So in terms of... Uh, guarding against sequencing risk, I think it's um, it's not a conversation that you need to be having, in my view. Carl, isn't right. it on 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 Adam's list? One was cash buffer. Is that not what you mean? You're anticipating you're going to be spending X next in the next twelve months, and you create a cash buffer to be drawn down upon. Is that not what you do? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, but I don't think a cash buffer is guarding against sequencing risk. So I don't think. Um, well, uh, you're not. You're not. You, sequencing risk is irrelevant, isn't it? Yeah. If you've got if you've got cash that you know exactly. you're going to spend the next eighteen months, let's Exa- say. Exa- yeah. Exactly. So you don't so put aside two years worth of living expenses, say, in a no, pot. No, we do. That's what I am saying. We do. 
So, but it's it's like we're not putting them into specific funds to guard against sequencing risk. Um, I think that's a totally no, you're, another you're, waste you're of time. You're creating a cash buffer. You're creating a, a, a pot so of every, cash that they're going to draw for, down upon to su- support yeah, for three. For I don't three think I can years. mention different funds. Um, Andy. Yeah, this is a huge subject. Subject again, um, and it crum, 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 crops up all the time. There's been reports written about it, books written about it. But as Carl's alluded to. Doing real financial plan with your clients will somewhat dictate what the strategy is. Um, our regulator, the FCA, um, is very much on this at the moment. And I believe a lot of advisors have been sent out a questionnaire around their sort of retirement financial planning strategy. Is it different to the accumulation? Um, Nick has coined the term of the centralized retirement advice proposition. You can all work out what the acronym CRAP. is for that. CRAP. You can all work out what the acronym is for that. Um, so it's a combination of, I suppose, most things that you mentioned in your question, Adam. Um, but when I do training with advisors, we go through this in a lot of detail. You know, I present Voy and I've been doing it for years. So, uh, yeah, at some point, maybe we could sit down and chew the fat on that. But, yeah, it's a, it's a meaty subject. Um, over to you, Nick or Alan. Well, I think from, from my viewpoint, I mean, in simplicity, and of course, there are always exceptions to the rule, but the default rule is, as we've already said, I mean, I, I'm calling it a cash buffer. I've been sitting down with a client. <clears throat> now, there are things that happen, as we actually talked about at the head of the show, which is unexpected events from which you need to get access to capital quite quickly. Uh, so that isn't necessarily factored in because you can't factor in every potential unexpected event. But generally speaking, people but that, have got... But- Sorry to interrupt, Alan, but that, that's why, like, structure products or, you know, lock-ins and all that, that's why they're, they don't form correct. part of, correct, correct. you know, of, of real financial planning if you're advising on investing. Um, but but for, the, it, for 90, let's say 90, 95% of the times, we will go into some detail with clients and say, to the level to which you can reasonably ex- expect or predict the future, are, they, are you planning any major capex expenditure this year? Have you got like a round the world cruise, buy, moving house, buying a new car, anything in addition to? Because we know what your expected monthly requirements are. We factored that in. We've got that sitting in cash. We know there's a trade off because you know you're not earning much on it. Although you're doing okay if you're with Transact, I mean, mentioned, um, <laughs> then they mentioned it earlier. Earlier. Um, so therefore, but we know that because that's not investment money. That's money we know you're going to spend in the next twelve to twenty four months. That to me is – so your sequence risk is – I mean, it's not, it's not completely eliminated, but it's significantly reduced by that because you're still invested. Yes. The money's – you've got, yes. you've got long-term investors. Money, you know, you know you're going to spend 10 years from now. Well, you know, let, let the markets grow that such that it's – the price of your, um, you know, putting petrol in the car 10 years from now is going to be more. So that's – we're, we're mitigating – inflation rises and so on but the money you're going to be spending and again it's, i think it's one of these ones and sorry to kind of put it down but it's kind of another over-engineered complexity yeah, most thing that look i know 100%. i'm going to spend i'm going to spend 50 grand next year like i've been doing every year in fact i might reduce it a bit because 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 all right well you've got 100 grand sitting in cash we're going to draw down upon that you've got eight you've got two years worth and then yes oh my god my daughter got divorced and so she needs 30 grand to help her with such and such okay we had either going to take that from the cash buffer, which is going to be shorter. We're going to spend some money that you're going to spend next year. Or we're going to have to look into the portfolio. We might do. We might possibly have to do that. But we can't really overly, you know, over-engineer the whole process. Andy? Most sequent, risk, most sequent risks exist in spreadsheets, not in real-life financial plans. And clients edit their behavior. Uh, yes, using a proper forecasting tool massively helps. And keep it simple. Keep it cautious. It, it doesn't matter that it's deterministic. It's the best we've got. I can't say to a client, yeah. I've got another solution. I'm not going to use deterministic. You're either going to be worth minus 500 or 16.8 million. You know, again, it's just going to give a fan output. Yes, it might give me a percentage success rate. But again, we're going down the a slightly different road now. But yeah, it, it yeah, is very you, hands you, on. You, you, you hit the nail, you hit the nail in the head. Because uh, this assumes that clients don't modify behavior during this sort of sequence risk challenges and every single time when I've, you know, when there's really, imagine, well, COVID, you couldn't travel, but before I remember back in 2008, markets were absolutely tanking. Guess what? People weren't spending at the same rate. They, everyone decided to just tighten their belt around them. So yeah, it's another one watch is it's spreadsheets versus real life. Yes, yeah. you have to be wise. You have to be sensible, but you're never going to just, you know, get it hundred percent accurate. It's, it's almost like we're dealing with real adults, isn't it? And not children. Almost. It, it almost like that. Um, Only grown-up investors I just will be successful. close on this. 
Adam, Adam, just closing your point, the one thing I would say is don't rely on natural income. I'm, I'm a definite a unit encashment person. You know what's going out, and it's total not return, some total lumpy, return. totally a random amount from a total dividend re- total fund. Total return is, is everything. Total return. Okay, now we had another question from Darren Bilkey, da- who's on Twitter, at Darren underscore Bilkey. But yours is quite a big question, uh, Darren, and I think what we'll do, if that's okay with you guys, because we're one minute, we're one hour and 15 minutes into the show, and, and we'll, we'll carry forward your your question to the uh, to the next show, if that's okay. Which means, inevitably, by by fair means or foul, we've got to Culture Corner, which is, uh, and we're still uh, still just about friends. So, uh, Mr. Smith, the kits. Oh God, yeah, the kits is summer readings. I had a look at this. Go on. <laughs> didn't 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 you like it? God, oh, that was good. God, we're coming to this the time of year where people tend to take some time off and sort of lounge around by a swimming pool and other things. And if you're anything like me, uh, you like to read read a few books when you are um, on your vacation. I'm always looking for new ideas, new books to read or to listen to. And I did like it. Michael Kitsis, which most of the listeners will be aware of, his, his, uh, his, his proliferation of content and output and podcasts and stuff. But he does produce this. Once a year, he produces his summer reading list and I had a look at it and there are, I think there are some really good suggestions a lot of books I'd never heard of before which I'm certainly going to buy or download a number of them some things which are kind of of the modern age it's kind of like living within this hybrid work lifestyle just some insights and ideas um, there's a just a, a few other just kind of representing financial planning in the in the modern era era um, there's a list of about a dozen books on it I'm probably going to buy four of them the link to his list are, is on our show notes, and I think it's well worth, despite what Nick says, well worth taking a look at and getting an idea or two. Thank decent, you. Decent, decent. Okay, very good. Uh, mine is uh, mine's a mine's a negative and, and a positive. So my my culture corner, dear dear Trappist, and if you're watching, I'll hold it up to the camera now. Uh, the essays of Warren Buffett now. The ultra crepidarian is going to have a mini panic attack here, but I, I tried to read this and found it awfully, awfully dull and dry, actually. So um, I'm willing to give this away. The first Trappist who hits me up, oh, shoot me, who reaches out, shoot me, who makes contact with me via a DM on LinkedIn. I will send that book to them. There you go. There's your present. What I did enjoy, and which I've also finished recently uh, via Audible, was the Tao of Charlie Munger. So Charlie Munger's wisdoms and quotations and speeches and I found that really enjoyable. I think of the two of them, Munger is actually the, the, the uh, probably I think the better communicator. He's he's he's, dr- he's bone dry, uh, but I did enjoy that. So I would I would go go carefully with the essays of Warren Buffett, but go into the Tower of Charlie Munger because that's really informative, really easy, and really quick. Mister Widger, muted, Carl. You're doing so well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I nearly did a full show that way. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Anyway, um, my one is uh, I did an interview, a wide ranging uh, interview with the currency about um, where the Irish financial advice industry is at. And uh, that's what the headline said. So the headline, I should just showed it for those watching on YouTube. Financial planner Carl Widger calls out the industry. Many aren't trustworthy. How to, win, how to win friends and influence people in Ireland. You're a bunch of cowboys. As you can imagine, um, I shared it on... Uh, I did the interview before I went on holidays, so, and I wasn't really... <laughs> I wasn't checking anything except I was checking the currency to say, I wonder what headline they'll put on that. So um, lo and behold, I got a little panic attack. Um, (laughs) So obviously that headline is a little bit out of context. Uh, However, there have been so many um, investments and unregulated investments and unregulated investment firms carrying on as if they were regulated, blah, blah, blah. So... I do think it's uh, something I can stand over. However, when I put it out on LinkedIn and Twitter, crickets, right? Nobody said anything. I did get a few text messages from real financial planners saying, fair play, delighted. But uh, I did note that nobody was publicly willing to um, back me on that one. But anyway, look, um, I was delighted to do it with currency because I think the currency is Ireland's number one without question, um, business news app. Um, so for me to be asked to contribute um, as a thought leader, that was pretty cool from my point of view. 
Um, it is behind a paywall, so um, I'm pretty sure every Irish advisor listening to this um, will have subscribed to the currency. So go check it out. And um, yeah, if you'd like to um, give me a little bit of backing, that would be great, but I don't expect it. Carl, why Good do lad. you think that you didn't get a lot of backing? For that, what you said was you just, you were just you didn't say anything which was not true was not demonstrably true by previous press reports, newspaper accounts, and so on. Why didn't other Irish advisors get behind you publicly? Any thoughts? I don't know. Like I look, I see. Um, I get I have tons and tons of followers from UK advisors, obviously because I know you guys and haven't s- spoken at at home before and all that kind of stuff. And I so I follow a lot of you guys and on. As, as in UK advisors on Twitter, and I can see you all fighting all the time, and you guys seem to be <laughs> much more comfortable with the conflict than Irish advisors are. Um, I think everybody in Ireland is like, who? why would you be upsetting people? I think there's much more, without any question or doubt, because I've heard of, heard of it, there's much more conversations going on behind the scenes, and uh, for sure I have a target on my back. And uh, for sure, um, people will be watching every step I make um, and every breath I take, probably. But uh, yeah, look, I can stand over what I said. I'm absolutely comfortable that it is fair to say that there are many who are untrustworthy and there are way too many advisors in the market. And I mentioned one or two things about the regulator and I stand over those also. Yeah, well, that's 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 the important thing, Carl. You can stand by what you said, and be, and, and that's that's the integrity yeah, yeah. that comes through. Where are we going? Um, with this? Yeah, where are we going with this? Thing? No, 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 no. The, I'm, I'm serious. The man yeah, in the arena yeah, thing, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. you can. Uh, okay, sorry. So no, I'm 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 being I'm actually being genuine. Um, now, Mister, come on, we're at one one hour twenty one minutes to, for the love of Christ. Um, spell <laughs> spellcaster, the fall of the fall of Sam Bankman Fried, Mister Hart. Yeah, so this is a new podcast um, from. Wondery, uh, which is a famous podcast studio, and they put this together. Uh, Spellcaster, The Fall of Sam Bankman Fried, which is the um, SB Freed, Freed, FB, FBF. Anyway, the interesting thing about this is this um, whole story about he was a massive donator to the effective altruism industry um, that yeah. went on a huge, you know, rise and tear, uh, mainly sort of backed and funded or to a part for what he was up to. Um, I know obviously Michael Lewis is going to cover this. There's going to be loads of different podcasts, loads of different films. Um, but yeah, I thought it was, uh, I've listened to the first one. It's uh, it's pretty decent. It's classic wonder. It's quite American, um, but yeah, decent and, and worth a, worth a, worth a listen. But yeah, does anyone have any comments about this effective altruism thing that you've uh, looked into? Or, or yeah, it's a bloody, that? it's a bloody fraud. This guy is an absolute crook. And he bent himself in this effective altruism thing, and then all the woke karate couldn't wait to suck up to the guy. And it's an out and out. The out, out. It's an I'm not sure. I think there's a guy. Fraud. Is it Will McCaskill? He was yeah, the sort of founder of effective pretty, altruism. I, I, yeah, I think he's legit. I think yeah. he is. I mean, I've got, I don't know. Yeah. I think he was the the incredible thing from what I've seen or read or watched about SBF is that he was. I mean, I'm not saying you should judge people for what they look like. He didn't look like the most impressive character with with his sort of mop of frizzy hair and his and his shorts wearing you know to big conferences and things but he clearly was a good salesman like often these guys are like bernie madoff was and many others were he was a brilliant salesman because i think he hoodwinked mccaskill and a bunch of these others to sort of get behind him because they they had existing credibility out there and he just sort of jumped on the back of their credibility i think they were as hoodwinked as much as many others were but all the, you know, it's all going to come out. I mean, I don't know. There's a trial, isn't it? There's got to be, there's a trial coming out. It won't be till I think there's a couple, the year yeah. or next year. No, there's a couple. A couple if, you, if you need to, if you need to boast about your altruism, it's, you're already in the, in the bin as far as I'm concerned. You do it, you do it yourself and you keep quiet about it. You don't bloody start writing books about it for Christ's sake. And that's the received word of God to end this show on. Is that fair enough, guys? One minute, 20, one hour, 23? And well, I'll be disappointed if we wrap up before hearing about Andy... Andy's drop. Come on. You want to hear Andy's drop? I do. And then we can finish. Come on. This is random, Dear Trappist. Enjoy. (laughs) Andy, the ultra grubbadarian Andy. He knows about everything. Andy can't be told anything. His name is Andrew Hart. Andrew Hart! There you go. There you go. Thank you. 
I've now got to rock up oh, to good. Heathrow Airport with a ticket that says Andy Hart when my name's Andrew Hart. So uh, wish me uh, good luck with that, people. Good, good luck. I, I, I we wish you good luck with that. Good flight. luck in... Enjoy, enjoy both of us. Thoughts okay. and prayers. That's thank that you, in, indeed you. in every respect. That is a wrap for this episode, dear Trappist. Thank you as ever for your time and input. Please do leave a six out of five star review on iTunes. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got about three hundred and something subscribers to the YouTube channel now, which is which is pretty hefty. Until the meantime, from the Trap Pack, it's adios and take care out there, folks. Goodbye. Bye.